answer me, please? Snake? Snake! Welcome back to the worst superhero movies ever made, a series where I reevaluate my personal biases. Today is a very special occasion. In honor of the new Suicide Squad soft reboot by James Gunn, I figure it's about time I finally tackle the other movie I've been teasing since I started this series. Now, the new one isn't out yet, but I think it looks like it might be pretty good. But I gotta watch the original first so I can truly get the full picture. For a little bit of background, I've only sort of seen this movie before. I watched it one time when it came out, and I heard it was bad, so I got drunk beforehand, just so I could enjoy it to its fullest. And I also turned it off about halfway through. So this is mostly going to be a new experience for me. Oh, but real quick, this video isn't sponsored by anybody, but I will warn you guys that Warner Brothers hates me. And some of you already know this, but occasionally they'll force me to mute clips or remove them completely if they have any kind of background music in them whatsoever. So if all of a sudden the audio cuts out or there's a weird visual glitch, it's them, not me. Just giving you guys a heads up. So, without further ado, let's decide if Suicide Squad truly is the worst superhero movie ever made. First shot of the movie and we have black text on a dark backdrop. That's right, baby. We're watching a real bad movie today. Okay, so right off the bat, we have one of my movie pet peeves. Licensed music. Now, I don't think all licensed music is bad in a movie. I think that a lot of films use licensed music very well, but that's only when the person who made the movie specifically had a certain song in mind for the scene. With some movies, you can tell the studio just kind of threw music in there for the hell of it. In this movie, music is basically chosen at random. So this first song is House of the Rising Sun, which is about a brothel in New Orleans. I mean, yeah, they're in Louisiana, but is that really as far as it goes? So anyway, our first main character is Will Smith. <sighs> Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And I wanna say right off the bat that I don't think Will Smith fits this role at all. I will admit, Will Smith really does know how to get people's butts in the theater. People will go see a movie just because it has him in it. But whenever he plays a grizzled criminal or anybody who's stoic, it always fails because he's just like a likable, charismatic guy. I don't see Will Smith as a hardened badass. May I go to my room, sir? Denied! Sit down! And right after our introduction to Will Smith, we get our second licensed song. We are only a minute or two away from the previous song, so I'd really like if we could space these out a little bit. And this song is used to introduce our second main character, Margot Robbie, as the Suicide Girl. Now, I think it's no secret at this point that Margot Robbie is pretty good at this character now. After watching Birds of Prey, I'd say that she is the most comic accurate superhero movie character next to, like, J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah, I don't really have any issue with claiming that. She's pretty good. And I can't really picture anybody else in the role. However, there is a big difference in Harley when she's being written by a woman. What? You are so cool. And when she is being written by a man. I see where I want, when I want, with who I want. <laughs> Birds of Prey was made to kind of fix Harley and distance herself from this movie a little bit. Because if you compare Harley in that movie and Harley in this movie, She's kind of fucking awful in this movie. She isn't cute or funny at all, so the shit that she says is a lot less bearable. Love your perfume. What is that? The scent of death? <laughs> anyway, just three minutes in, and we have song number three, which is Sympathy for the Devil. So far, that's a new song every single minute. That is fucking insane. This song is to introduce our third character, Amanda Waller. She's a strict, no-nonsense government lady who wants to gather the super-powered criminals and use them for a special task force. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you guys real quick. 
I was putting this video off for a while because I have trouble explaining why this movie is bad. And I don't think I'm alone in that. You don't really see as many long video essay breakdowns for this movie as you would for, say, Batman v Superman, even though I think this is by far the worst movie. The thing is, you kinda have to watch this for yourself to truly understand how shitty it is. It's not like some of the other movies that I've talked about in this series where I can just show you a funny out of context clip and that's it, it speaks for itself. This movie is truly bad down to its core. So far in the span of four short minutes, we have three licensed songs, we're introduced to three main characters, we get multiple flashbacks for Harley Quinn, then flashbacks for Superman's funeral, and also Harley Quinn does this. The movie literally just started and it feels like it's rushing everything. So next, at five minutes in, we have our fourth song, which is our first rap song. You can see me on the Riviera dressed like a playboy. Now this is another pet peeve of mine, but I hate when a movie has a rap song and it's just to introduce the black character. I don't know, man, like, come on. This song is to introduce Deadshot a second time. And immediately you can see where the Deadpool inspiration kicks in. See, I didn't explain it before, but the deal with this movie and the reason it feels so fucking weird is that it's basically two movies. It's kind of the same situation as the Joss Whedon Justice League cut. This movie got made like 90% of the way and then Warner Brothers panicked at the last second and they were like, fuck, this movie's boring and Batman v Superman did really bad because it was dark and boring and Deadpool did really well and is really popular. We need to make this movie into Deadpool now. So then they took the movie and they fucking chopped it up into little pieces and they tried to make it into Deadpool, which obviously doesn't work. And that's also why Birds of Prey is basically just Deadpool for girls. So yeah, this movie's basically two movies cut into one. They reshot and rewrote and re-edited a bunch of stuff, and it's not as obviously like egregious as Justice League, but I do think that the final product is much messier and more confusing. I mean, who knows what the movie would have looked like if WB didn't fuck with it so much. Because apparently the director David Ayer described his original cut of this movie as a soulful drama. So anyway, Deadshot is an expert marksman who's just trying to make an honest living as a gun for hire. And then Batman swoops down and beats him up in front of his daughter. Batman, please don't kill my dad! And now, he's in super jail. After that, we get our second introduction to Harley, and we get our fifth licensed song, Super Freak by Rick James. Harley Quinn. <laughs> I mean, this one technically fits too. She is super freaky. I think I just find any unironic use of this song to be extremely hilarious. Keep in mind, this movie was originally intended to be a soulful drama. And you can tell that this quick montage of Harley's backstory was intended to be much longer and more fleshed out, but now it's cut up into little pieces with almost all of the dialogue gone and none of the actors' performances are showing at all and they just decided to throw a fucking Rick James song in for good measure. Also, I can say here that Jared Leto's Joker in this movie just doesn't work. He straight up does not feel like the Joker at all. And I'm fine with different interpretations of comic book characters, especially a character like the Joker. Heath Ledger's Joker doesn't really feel like the Joker either, but he's doing his own thing and it works for that movie. This Joker just isn't the Joker. He could be any gangster character. He's kind of a douchebag. He isn't intimidating or creepy. He's just like a fuck boy. <laughs> One of our only scenes with him is a flashback where he's trying to get Common to fuck Harley. And it's just so fucking awkward. I don't want no beef. You want no beef? You don't want Why, no beef? Wrong? You don't want no beef? Why is this the one scene you decided to keep in its entirety? Yo, Jake. What the fuck is going on? Anyway, Batman arrests Harley for like a DUI or something. I don't know, I haven't seen the movie. But now we're under 14 minutes in and we're given our fifth montage. This time introducing a fourth character and featuring the sixth licensed song so far. And now we're one minute later at the 15 minute mark introducing our fifth character with our seventh licensed song. And I can't even tell if this song is thematically appropriate or not because this introduction doesn't even teach me anything about this character. Also, here's a fun product of the reshoots. 
They say that when this guy was in prison, the inmates all attacked him at once, and then he killed them with his fire powers. But I don't know, it doesn't look like anybody was near him to me. And then later, we see that footage again, and we clearly see that nobody was fighting him at all. This is a weird thing that this movie does. They clearly shot one thing, but then they rewrote the backstories for these characters, but didn't change the footage. This movie constantly will tell us one thing, and then just use a take that contradicts what we are told. This movie has such bad editing that it actively lies to you. Oh, and don't blink, because it's just 30 seconds later, and we have our sixth character, and eighth licensed song, which is... They call him Killer Croc. Fortunate son for Killer Croc? This song is about Vietnam. What does it have to do with the crocodile man that lives in the sewer? Oops, no, sorry, I can't focus on that for too long because just a minute later, we have the seventh character. And this one, this one's actually important for the plot. Those other guys, they don't really matter that much. But this one is the important one. Honestly, it's your fault for not knowing that, you idiot. Oh look, another character. I actually forgot this guy was in this movie. Oh, and by the way, those last two characters from that last montage, they fell in love off screen. I mean, yeah, we haven't heard a single line of dialogue from either of them, and they've only been on screen for less than two minutes, but this movie wants us to be invested in their romance. I cannot stress enough that this is the exact opposite way to make a movie, but we still just started. It is very painful for me whenever I realize how little of the movie has passed. So far, this movie has spent its entire first 20 minutes on introducing characters with these insane montages. And after all of that, we don't know any of these people. Anyway, let me try to speed things along and try to explain the plot. So this girl is the Enchantress. She's possessing this researcher girl and she has magical powers. So the government keeps her on their payroll so she can like do stuff for them. I don't know. Amanda Waller has her heart in a box too. So if the Enchantress goes too crazy, she can like stab the heart with like a pen or whatever she has on hand and it calms her down. Basically, this also leads to Amanda Waller wanting more superheroes, or metahumans, for her task force. And yeah, she knows about Aquaman and the Flash, and she's friends with Batman, but she does not ask them to be on her team. Instead, she just visits the super jail to pick up Killer Croc and Diablo and Harley Quinn. I mean, yeah, I guess if Aquaman's not answering your calls, beggars can't be choosers. But here's something about the Suicide Squad series that I always think is a little silly. I get why Deadshot's here, okay? He's human, but he has a near inhuman ability to shoot stuff with guns super well. And I understand like the big shark and characters like that. I get everything but Harley Quinn. She's just a normal girl with a bat. Why would the government want her help? She doesn't offer any tactical assistance. She's not really that good of a fighter. I gotta work on my cardio. You can do karate, what are you talking about? Anyway, don't think about that stuff. Look, Deadshot's on the screen. Hey, somebody put on the Kanye song. I think this might be the first racist soundtrack. And I should also bring up the fact that the dialogue in this movie is butt ass. Damn, that is just a mean Lady. And I think most of it's only bad because the movie is literally out of order. So far, Amanda Waller is trying to assemble a team, but we don't know what it's for because there is no threat at this point. This ain't World War II. It's World War III. No, it's not. There is no conflict. I'm fairly sure that by this point in the original draft, the central antagonistic force was probably already established. But in this version of the movie, we have spent the first half hour just cramming in as many flashbacks and montages and fucking music videos in so we can justify how many people are in this movie. There's also this super weird scene where Joker's sitting in his ridiculous knife room, or as he calls it, his knife room. And his goon comes in and he's like, What is she? Well, uh, you left her to get arrested by the Batman. She's in jail. You don't remember that? But then this henchman explains with dialogue that they added in post that she's being held in a super secret prison. Everybody's disappearing. 
There's this new law where if you're a bad enough bad guy, they stamp terrorist on your jacket. And it's pretty obvious to me that this scene clearly belonged somewhere else in the movie, and it had a completely different purpose in the story. And that happens a lot. Man, look at Joker's face. I feel you, man. I don't get what's going on either. But you know, I gotta say, the longer I watch this movie, the more Jared Leto's Joker is growing on me. Because he is so fucking stupid. But it's kind of funny. And that's really all I have to look forward to in this movie. So meanwhile, the Enchantress takes over the researcher lady's body, and she flies away one night to find her brother? I guess she has a brother. No one told me that. But he's lying dormant in this random guy. Was this stuff supposed to be established in an earlier scene? Cause I think we forgot to put that in. Oh, but I'm sorry, my mistake. They explained that her brother was inside a jar in this tiny little bit of text right here. So wait, I was actually supposed to read all the shit that was on the screen whenever a character got introduced? Yeah, let me tell you, some of this is very important information. Out of all those fucking flashbacks and montages, you didn't explain to me anything about this character's romantic subplot, her brother, her powers, her plan, and now this is happening. I have no context for what I'm looking at. Is this a new movie? Did I change the channel? Do not burn and yo, can we cool it with the music? Whose idea was the music? This is like the 10th or 11th fucking song and the movie just won't slow down for a second. I don't have time to process how many things are being thrown at me. So you remember when I told you guys that I tried watching this movie when I was drunk? Well, now I know why I tuned it out. Because this movie already makes you feel drunk. So being drunk on top of that is just downright disorienting. So if you're out there and you don't drink alcohol, I will just tell you straight up, this is what it feels like. So anyway, Enchantress awakened her brother, who turned into a monster. And then the Enchantress flies back to her hotel and turns back into a normal human. Then seconds later, her and the white man just appear at the city that her brother is attacking. And I don't mean seconds later from our perspective, they basically teleport there. I know that because he's still on the train tracks fighting people. What are they trying to do? Well, I guess they're trying to kill her brother. How are they planning on doing that? Again, I do not know. He just looks at her and he says this. I can't do this, I listen, can't. Listen, there's no other way. Just get it done. What? What does that mean? This guy is also fully aware that her demonic form is what awakened this monster guy in the first place. So why is he okay with unleashing her again? I'm even more confused because Amanda Waller is upset that this is happening. She's like, ah, oh, what the fuck is the Enchantress doing? And then she starts stabbing the heart like a freak. This is also the first time that the threat of the movie has appeared, but Amanda Waller already got her team together before all this happened. I mean, that's pretty convenient. Literally hours after you assemble your team, a supervillain appears. I just have to say again, it feels like this movie was made wrong. There are clearly scenes and lines of dialogue missing. And the scenes that are in the movie give us zero context for what is happening because they're all out of order. Half of the characters that got these flashy montages haven't even said or done anything yet. And despite that, the movie feels like it's halfway done already. I'm really remembering why I put this video off for so long. I don't know if I can do this. I cannot analyze a movie that isn't interested in making sense. Maybe I am a fraud. Maybe that makes me a bad critic. You know what? No, I can't do this. Cut the fucking mic. I'm done. I'm gonna go watch other movies. There's other movies out there that are actually good and worth watching. Okay, so uh, it's day two of me attempting to watch this movie. Uh, this isn't a bit either. I legitimately had to go take a break. But I'm here now. I'm ready to dive back in. I'm in a much better mood. I'm hydrated. I'm feeling good. And, uh, and immediately we have another licensed song. <laughs> Is this music? I love, I can't get enough of that sweet music. You know, Seven Nation Army doesn't fit this scene either. What, you pick it because it has army in the title of the song? And this scene has army men? Oh, and if that's not enough, we get another character for our suicide squad. <laughs> oh my god, you can't do that, I'm pretty sure. So at this point in the movie, our heroes are being recruited to go in and stop the Enchantress and her brother except they aren't. That's right, even though Amanda Waller specifically made this task force to fight against other superpowered individuals, she's using them to extract somebody from the city. Two trailer park girls go around the outside. 
I'm sorry, I can't keep commenting on the music or I'll be here all fucking day. Also, right as they get on their helicopter and leave to go to the city, another fucking character shows up at the last minute. It's like she was late. They even immediately rush to like this quick flashback montage for her so she can get one just like everybody else. This is so sloppy and it feels like a mistake. It feels like they forgot to put this character in the movie until now. I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. <laughs> Honestly, if anything, I should just at least be happy that her montage didn't have any licensed music. Gonna go to the place there's on. See, this song is called Spirit in the Sky, and in this scene, they are in the sky. So now every single one of our stupid ass characters are introduced, and the plot has actually begun, and at this point, this starts to feel like a real movie. Up to now, it's basically been a music video, but this is where things level out a bit. And right off the bat, one of our characters decides that he wants to get the hell out of this movie. Oh. His head blew up. See, now this is the only guy that didn't get a montage or a flashback or anything. So yeah, it's pretty obvious he was gonna die right away. He literally dies like a few minutes after he's introduced. Now, if this was actually done better, I think this would be kind of funny. And like I said, the new Suicide Squad movie isn't out yet as of the time of me making this video. And there are a shitload of characters in that. So I kind of hope that more of them die just to show that they are truly expendable. I also hope that movie has actual characters in it because this movie notably has very bad character work. In trying to cram all of these characters in and waste time on flashbacks and stupid shit like that, we are left with nobody to latch onto emotionally. The character that has the most development at this point in the movie isn't Deadshot and it isn't Harley, it's fucking Rick Flag. Who? Oh! And saying that he is a developed character is like saying Bob the Tomato is a developed character. Actually, I'm sorry, that was an insult to Bob. I don't even have examples to show you guys how these are bad characters because there's no evidence in this movie for me to show you anything. I can't show you something that isn't there. Most of the character work in this movie was montages or characters bickering or characters boasting and trying to show how cool they are. Every character feels like the same character. I thought maybe Captain Boomerang was gonna be like the comic relief, but he doesn't fucking say or do anything in the whole movie. I don't even know why he's here. And you know what? I changed my mind. I think the Joker really is the only character in this movie that I like because he's the only one who's doing something different than everybody else. But either way, these characters fucking suck. They're dull, they have no soul, and they say stupid shit. I don't even have enough time to point out how many dumb lines are in this movie. Stay evil, doll face. We're bad guys, it's what we do. What, we some kind of suicide squad? Yeah, That's the name of the movie. But hey, check it out, we actually have an action scene now. I mean, we gotta get some shots for the trailer, so let's have our characters fight some generic Power Rangers villains for a little bit. And seriously, again, why is Harley here? You guys have trained soldiers and people with superpowers. Why did we bring the naked girl with the baseball bat and the destiny pistol? Also, seriously, what the fuck are they fighting? Is this movie allergic to giving us context? Oh, sorry, no, my mistake. They tell us what these guys are in the scene after they fight them. Why is everything out of order? Even some of the worst movies I've ever seen have had their scenes in the correct order. That's like the first thing you learn. It is such a weird thing to fuck up. And also, I think it's really funny that the Power Rangers putties are super fucking vicious when they kill the unnamed soldiers, but they act like they don't wanna hurt the main characters. They tear the normal people to pieces, but when they get to Flag, they try to carry him away like they're left for dead zombies. So anyway, after that, the Suicide Squad wanders around and they get to that building where they have to extract somebody. And then they get into another fight with more faceless zombies. And then the zombies try to drag Rick Flag away again. And after it happened the second time, I was thinking, okay, there's gotta be something to this. Maybe because, you know, the Enchantress is in love with him. She told them to capture him alive or something. But no, there's no reason. They just keep trying to drag him away. They have to flag again! And they also keep saying that if Flag dies, they die, which isn't true. Half of the time, they say that they want to overpower him and take the detonator for themselves. And the other half of the time, they fucking love him. It's like he's part of their family. 
I lost one family, I ain't gonna lose another one. You guys do not know each other. It's worth mentioning at this point, this movie has a lot of weird moments where the team acts like they're friends. Harley calls Deadshot her friend, even though we've never seen them have a real conversation before. You're my friend too. But we haven't seen these guys bond or get to know one another. This movie's over an hour in by now, and I don't know what the fuck we spent that time on. But anyway, after that dumb fight, the Suicide Squad learns that the person they needed to extract from this building was... <gasps> Amanda Waller. They are in fact not here to stop the supervillains. They are just here to give Waller a ride home. I wish I was making that up because none of this makes any sense. Firstly, Amanda Waller assembled her squad before she entered the city. She rounded them up for a mission to rescue her before she was even there. She didn't need rescuing yet. The team literally got brought together and debriefed before she even arrived there. And what's even more baffling is that they tell us that she was there the whole time. But that's not true, because we heard the other government dudes earlier say for Waller to get her team into the city once the incident happened. But this fucking guy says that they were already there. This is supposed to be like a big twist or something, but there's no way to interpret it in a way that makes sense. And then when you realize that she assembled this strike team of superpowered individuals just so they could give her a ride home, it becomes laughable. So anyway, they call an Uber for Waller, but the Joker hijacks their ride because he's here to save Harley. Joker grabs Harley, and they just slowly fly away, and then Waller begs Deadshot to shoot her, even though she has multiple soldiers that apparently aren't interested in shooting Harley or the helicopter that just attacked them. But whatever, I can't get mad, because I get to see the Joker again, and it makes me so happy to see him. He's just so ridiculous. But also, there's something about his line delivery in this scene that sounds really weird. This bird is baked. Like for some reason they re-recorded his lines and he sounds extra strange. He sounds like Jim Carrey from The Mask. Okay, honey, it's me and you. Hold on, sugar. Daddy's got a sweet tooth tonight. However, after he reunites with Harley, their helicopter gets shot down and he blows up. No! Oh my god! No! 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 And this is truly devastating to me because now I really have nothing to enjoy in this movie. But also, this scene is pretty weird because it doesn't look like Harley's that upset that her boyfriend died. Hey guys, I'm back! She looks more dejected. It's almost like she's upset that she got dumped. This is my theory. If you remember, in Birds of Prey, Harley says that she got dumped by the Joker, and we never see this happen. But I think that that was supposed to happen in this movie. But for whatever reason, they changed it. It was confirmed that in this movie, the original idea was to have Deadshot and Harley grow a romance in this movie. But obviously, that didn't work out in the final cut, and Joker ends up staying with Harley in this movie. But I don't think that's how it was supposed to go. I think he was supposed to break up with her at some point in this sequence because the thing is her reaction in this scene and the fact that all of his scenes have re-recorded dialogue just shows me that the story was changed at some point. I think everything after the helicopter blowing up is the footage that was intended to be in the original movie. Harley's upset because she got dumped and then she gets encouraged by her allies to keep fighting. Because also, in this scene, it doesn't make sense that they all just accept her back into the group, no questions asked. Because the Joker tried to kill them, and she betrayed them. And yeah, you can make the excuse that they're bad guys, and they don't care if they get betrayed by their friend. But why would Rick Flagg be okay with this? He's supposed to kill her if she tries to escape, but now she's back after she just got some of his men killed and he literally doesn't care. He doesn't say a single word about it. Also, Harley doesn't have any reason to stay here. Her bomb is deactivated. She can just leave, but no, she stays with the group and lets the government decide her fate. This is possibly the most out of character thing that she could do. It really feels like there are two movies smushed into one another. 
it's very clear something is off about this. But anyway, Amanda Waller gets into her Uber, and then it gets shot down. And then the putties kidnap her, and they bring her to the Enchantress so that the Enchantress can be like, Now tell me how to destroy your armies. What? I don't know. Just stab them with magic tentacles. You've been doing fine so far. After that, Flag finally explains what's been going on. He tells the group that the Enchantress has taken over the city. Honestly, that's the only thing that I knew for sure. I did not need any more clarification there. However, he does show more of that flashback from earlier of the Enchantress transforming and running away with her brother. Now, I thought this extended scene would make this scene make more sense, but it doesn't. It doesn't explain why they sent her in, because again, they know that she caused this problem in the first place. They know that Enchantress is trying to run away with her brother, but they still sent her in to confront her brother. Needless to say, the whole thing was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, no shit, buddy. This flashback to a flashback also introduces a new stupid aspect where she leaves this bomb underground with Flag before she runs away to her brother, which is very confusing. I wonder how he dealt with that. But also, it doesn't explain why Waller stabbing the heart didn't stop the Enchantress. The heart just doesn't matter anymore. She's fine without it because her brother makes it so that the heart isn't necessary. This is the one flashback that somehow makes things more confusing. Oh, and by the way, if that wasn't bad enough, Rick Flagg says that all of this happened three days ago, which is simply not true because that shit was happening while the Suicide Squad was on their way to the city. It took them three days to fly a few states away. This is the one time the movie tries to clarify things and it manages to make things worse. So after the squad hears this, they decide to leave the movie and go get a drink at a bar. And I will say that this is the one normal scene in the movie. The characters actually sit around and they have a meaningful conversation for once. The movie is almost over, but now it's finally decided to try. Maybe this is the soulful drama that we were promised. This scene isn't perfect though. For instance, Diablo explains how he killed his wife and kids, and Harley is horrified to hear this. And the kids? He killed them. What? You're Harley Quinn. You helped kill Robin in this universe. Why do you care if children die? He killed them. Didn't you? Something tells me a whole lot of people are about to die. But I still think that this is the one scene in the entire movie that is trying to be a real movie. And it's very strange, but this movie gets more normal as it goes on. It starts to gradually slow down. It has kind of like the opposite progression of a regular movie. I'm starting to think that the last third of this movie is some of the least tampered with content that we've seen so far. However, there are still hints of a bad movie sprinkled around. The editing is still very strange. It's not real. He's right. It's not real. The dialogue is still awful. Lady, you are evil. And we still have no context and no connection to the main villain. We never got to know anything about her. She could have been replaced with any character. She's probably the worst villain I have ever seen in a superhero movie. And I do not say that lightly. And at the end of the day, this movie does not change the trope of every DC movie ending in a dumb CGI monster fight. And there are still logical inconsistencies at every turn. Remember that bomb from the previous scene? Well, they use it to blow up the Enchantress's brother, even though they told us they can't blow him up from underground. I think this is the first time a movie has attempted to gaslight me. It really is just impossible to make total sense of this movie. For a brief moment, I gave it the benefit of the doubt, but the movie is basically over and the foundations are just too broken. So at this point, when Harley stops the big dumb ERJB and she says this, You mess with my friends! I feel nothing because they aren't friends. But hey, 
Maybe in the air cut they were friends. Maybe in the soulful drama cut they were friends. But in this version, they are not friends. So that's it. The bad guy's defeated. The Suicide Squad goes back to jail. And the movie ends with one last licensed song. Open your eyes. Look up to the sky. <laughs> I am so glad this is over. I really underestimated just how bad this movie is. This movie doesn't do a single thing correctly. This movie is simply broken. It is a Franken movie. It is two movies haphazardly stitched together to make something that I can't even refer to as a film. Even the post credit scene is cut awkwardly. The last shot of the movie isn't even cut right. Shut it down. My friends and I'll do it for you. I touch you. What the fuck is going on? The fact that the movie was released in this state is an embarrassment. I usually give a lot of excuses to dumb, bad superhero movies, and that's why I made this series. But this is truly my limit. This is the movie that I now have to compare against all others from now on. Because this truly is, in my humble opinion, the worst superhero movie ever made. So, to wrap it up, I'm gonna give Suicide Squad a prestigious, monumental 1 out of 10.